much. Um, cool, say hello, I'm James Byrne. Uh, I'm doing a, the workshop, as you are probably well aware of the seeing and alleviating technical debt and software. Um, so, uh, so I'm keeping it uh, as simple as possible, going through the five W's, although I'm abusing that concept by adding how and then merging the other two, um, about what technical debt is and how we alleviate it. Um, this is a slideshow mainly with uh, some personal experiences thrown in from my own software development background. Uh, there will be opportunity for interaction as well. So uh, to do that, we're going to use the Google Doc. Um, and if you scroll down um, under the discussions uh, section, I've sort of uh, put a load of uh, uh, spaces for people to answer as they go along. Um, so uh, the picture to me reflects the choice, uh, re uh, reflects the concept of technical debt in, in systems. Uh, over time, even with the best intention, systems always grow to some degree organically. Um, so we have really good reason to think about technical debt and how to alleviate it so that we don't end up with server rooms like this, although this is not particularly about server rooms, obviously. Um, afterwards, we'll go through some conclusions and then there's time for Q&A, some resources and some exercises if people uh, fancy giving those a go. So, uh, so who am I? I uh, I'm a research software engineer in the Bass AI lab. Um, I previously held other roles at BAS, so as a data manager, a Unix engineer, I've worked on low power instrumentation all up to, all the way up to our sort of uh, our storage network and HPC. Um, but primarily, um, I, I spend my time uh, trying to promote sustainable technology and community within the polar science community and within BAS, uh, as well as trying to help innovate through the use of sustainable technological implementations. Before BAS, though, I was uh, very much a software developer. Uh, a Linux and DevOps consultant at various times as well. So I've worked with lots of clients and then lots of uh, industry sectors. Um, so who is this uh, presentation for? Well, it's for anyone who makes decisions regarding technical implementations. So it's not just for software developers um, because all roles can have an effect on the amount of debt that we're accumulating over time. Um, so, uh, a bit of a poll. Uh, how familiar are people with technical debt? There's a big table there. If people want to stick a one to five, uh, one if you're not at all familiar, uh, and five if you're very familiar and occasionally have nightmares uh, about technical debt, that would be uh, that would be great. Um, and I'll, I'll I'll have a little nosy at that in a minute. But um, I'll move on to why while people are filling that out. Um, so why why give this talk? So it's a dive into the deep end for me as a new SSI fellow uh, to talk about my own experiences. Um, I've been working with software for about 20 years in total, so uh, I've got a few nightmares of my own. Um, hopefully, I'm, I'm, well, I'm hoping to spur some thinking in new and existing developers. Um, you know, we can all, uh, we all take a new perspective every once in a while, so that's great. Um, but technical debt is not talked about explicitly. Um, I think personally that it's a keystone topic in software sustainability, but it's one that's seldom discussed a great deal. And I see from the uh, from the responses that there's a there's a you know a nice mix of people uh, with various degrees of uh, awareness of technical debt. So primarily, um, uh, the reason why I want to talk about it is because technical debt is always present. It's not something that um, is or is not there. It's always there to some degree. Um, recognition helps software engineers to build sustainable software. So if we if we know that it's there, or we know how to alleviate it, then we're only going to be better at what we're doing. Um, now we can optimize uh, we can optimize technical debt by looking at things like technical debt ratios. So the, the you know by trying to quantify the the effort over the impact in order to provide us a, a ratio of how much debt we're going to accumulate. Um, but really, I think that actually it's more about the balance of effort versus impact. So um, you know it's all very well and good trying to come up with quantifications, but actually it's just about in my opinion the most important aim is to help people build intuition about how to balance the, the effort versus impact of any debt that they might accumulate. Um, so uh, some people have already started that's grand but um, can people um, also give a, a, a one sentence description in the next uh, uh, section about uh, what they think technical debt actually is in, in a sentence? because um, we'll roll through a couple of uh, other uh, <laughs> a couple of other definitions there's some great ones coming up yeah so this is this is great so quick short-term solutions which create more work in the long run I mean that's really brilliant um, 
so I mean, there's a really long one here on screen. Uh, while while people write their own in, um, this is from Ward Cunningham, who was the uh, one of the founding fathers of the agile software movement. Um, but this is very long. He likened every, it to the concept of financial debt, which is great um, because everyone's familiar with financial debt to some degree. Um, but there's a couple of cons that I find with this very long uh, definition of technical debt. Uh, it squarely deals with writing software as a team programmer, which, of course, Agile was very much focused on. Um, it has a bit of a con in that it's uh, it's sort of become a bit aged because things like DevOps have come along and infrastructure as code um, that have so many more um, side effects and impacts um, uh, since the Agile movement really uh, started. Um, and it's a rather long and specific view of what technical debt might be. So another one which is uh, freely available is via Wikipedia. is uh, actually comes from Technopedia. Um, this is this has also got a couple of uh, a couple of things I don't necessarily agree with, which is that it focuses very much on the negatives of what technical debt is. Um, it's also a, it's also a bit assumptive that we always know what the best solution will be and might choose not to use it, whereas that's not always necessarily the case. So um, we'll, we'll run through some of the ones that we've got here, but um, I came up with a couple of notions as well. Um, you know, design decisions possibly incurring future efforts, which is a very vague or flexible notion, the way you do something undermining you or your other's efforts in the future. And I think we'll probably find that some of these are very similar that we've got on the screen. So, uh, so decisions made historically that affect the ability to run modify code in the future, that's brilliant, yeah. Uh, karma, I like that. That's perfect. One word. I mean, whoever's done that is winning. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, I mean, you know, there's some other great ones here as well. So shortcuts to achieve functionality or outputs in the short term that cause the technology to become brittle in the long term. That's a brilliant way of looking at it. I like the term brittle as well. Um, you know, we have to be careful with definitions. So debt, I, I think even the concept of technical debt, the, the word debt is very much a negative uh, word to to uh, describe this with whereas I, I really do look at it and I think karma says this uh, is the word for this it's really about finding balance between the efforts now and the efforts that we're going to have to expend in the future um, and that's not necessarily a, a negative activity and I think technical debt you know, we should always bear that in mind because we have to do this so um, so when where are we going to actually find technical debt or when when are we identifying technical debt so I'm going to run through a few examples that I've come across in my time um, so I've identified technical or I've acknowledged that when I've been criticizing the design decisions of, of something that I've been working on so an example of this was databases growing and impacting code performance that I've seen quite a lot in uh, desktop applications that are uh, backed by a relational database um, so the, the the criticism comes from uh, the fact that these can be very difficult to refactor. They tend to be very sort of uh, um, they tend to be fairly uh, what's the word uh, adjoined uh, layers. Um, so the refactor was difficult. The system wasn't scalable. There wasn't any testing in place. So it makes not life a bit of a nightmare. So I ended up criticizing design decisions that have been made in that applications development. Uh, the tip though. The tip to take from that was that code testing and design improves the sustainability of that application. And the reflection is that nobody could have foreseen that the database was going to get as big as it did. Um, and they were they were not aware when they wrote it um, of the, the lifetime of that tool. So ultimately, you know, don't if I be too negative about the design decisions other people made. So the next uh, the next item there is small changes requiring refactors. Uh, which can drive a software developer to madness, uh, quite understandably. Um, a really good example of this in my past has been monolithic code bases for data processing. We used to process client data into, into uh, print runs. Um, the manifestation of that was that if you changed a parameter in the code, it had numerous side effects, uh, that it had un unidentifiable or untraceable logic. Um, and refactoring was almost not authorized. So, you know, even changing uh, the logic of a parameter was very much a don't touch it or it will break, uh, which is just slightly insane, to be fair. Um, <laughs> so, uh, the debt in the end justified a multi year project to refactor the software as a whole. So, the tip there is that if you forget how it's working yourself, someone else is going to be even more confused when they come to change uh, the logic of the system. 
uh, especially in a monolith. Um, the reflection here, though, is organic growth will happen. So be sympathetic to the fact that it exists at all. Uh, the reason it got so big is because it's just growing and growing and growing. Um, so uh, thanks to Steve for pointing me at this, but uh, a very new term these days is code smells, so smelly code. Uh, I think that's a brilliant way of describing it. Um, a, a great example of this in my past is a single use code base, uh, which was expected to be adopted, but not for operational use. Um, so, you know, it was very much a case of take, uh, taking code, copying and recopying and cloning lots of redundant code, uh, leading to really, really long scripts. Um, you know, this this was code full of smells that does not fit for operational use in a way the interfaces didn't work. It, it wasn't uh, able to be uh, adopted as part of a wider workflow. Uh, the tip here is that code design always makes things fit for operational use from the start. So um, uh, my, my reflection on this, though, is that it's not open to criticism. Um, somebody had done their best to produce something that was very useful and you just have to do a refactor um, or a set of refactors. Um, and that's a really positive thing, actually. It, the fact that you're willing to do the refactors to adopt that code is a good thing. So code smells are not necessarily a bad thing either, even though it's, it's a great term. <laughs> um, so unaccommodating functionality is another way that I've identified uh, technical debt. An example is middleware, um, or a classic example is middleware integration of components. Um, and then we have some particular ones in the past that were legacy unmaintained low level code bases with no documentation, uh, no maintainers, and more importantly, nobody willing to maintain them. Uh, so the debt manifest or the, the debt there is that people had to rewrite the entire infrastructure in order to replace those black boxes uh, and the functions that they were sort of providing. And I say sort of providing, because we didn't really understand what the functions always were. Um, so the tip there is even small comments are useful um, down the line that's going to help someone understand what the, the software is doing. The reflection is that it was the right, these components were the right tool for the right job at the time, but when it came to integrating them as part of a wider middleware, um, they couldn't be built, easily built upon because there just wasn't any documentation there. So uh, really unaccommodating functionality there. And the last one is low cohesion and strong coupling of code. Um, so this is what the diagram on the right there is uh, indicating. And I think this is a really good, um, it's a really good concept uh, that sort of aligns with that um, is, you know, when you're looking at the way a system is architected, um, is it is it sort of allowing you to break it apart and refactor individual parts of it? And a classic example here, and this is probably going back a little bit because I haven't done web dev in a while, is LAMP stacks. Um, they are notoriously bad for um, exhibiting smelly code. They can be extremely monolithic, um, so they can have very, very, very long scripts. And even though they might employ design patterns like model view controller, which is used commonly in web applications, they might not actually break apart very easily. Um, so the debt here is that, uh, or the danger there is that actually even employing something like MVC or uh, LAMP stacks, which are very uh, standard patterns for developing web applications, they are not in themselves solutions to the idea of technical debt. Um, so splitting out the, the solution there is to split out the operational layers, uh, define interfaces, and the reflection is to really look from the outset about how this is actually going to scale if it ever needs to scale. Um, so I've, I've gone through a few experiences and stuff there. That's really the beefiest slide of it all. So um, the, the concept of debt isn't to focus on the negative reflections, as I've sort of listed them as bullet points there, but it's to promote the value of the refactor. In all of those cases, actually, like it wasn't that we just decided to scrap everything. Um, everything became a refactor of some form or another, and that's the most important thing to, uh, to focus on. Um, so moving on uh, a bit uh, in the when, where, um, so one could argue it's not solely about code in today's world. As I said, infrastructure might also be driven by code as well as many other things like networking and whatnot. Um, so technical debt takes on many forms. Um, when you plan what you're going to do, the plan will likely change. Uh, when you decide how you're going to do it, those decisions could have been better in hindsight. When you write some code one day, you'll wish you wrote it better. And when you build an infrastructure, you'll eventually identify its limits. Refactoring is the most important thing you can do and a great skills building exercise. Um, it promotes introduction of group design and back compatible changes, as well as defensive coding to make sure that you're not breaking existing code. And it can be done by anyone as part of the development process. And that last point is really important to, to note there. And I'm really stressing the refactoring here. So, um, 
So how are we going to alleviate technical debt as we go along? Well, we can learn new uh, languages and technologies, uh, you know, but the esotericness of a, of a language is no indication of whether it's fit for purpose. And there's no ubiquitously brilliant language or technology. So just choose things that are fit for purpose uh, based on the features of those technologies. Uh, we can read books and that's not never a bad thing, but there's no single authoritative reference for how to be a good software developer. Uh, I think that's a fair, fair statement. Um, we can choose uh, certain ways of architecting our systems, but once again, there's no uh, one hit approach uh, to how on how to design all systems. Uh, you know, I've seen great monoliths, but uh, uh, seen great monoliths in, uh, in, in the classic uh, Godzilla. Of course, Godzilla has at times been a good entity. Uh, and microservices and surface orientated architectures are great and often cited as being the way forward for all systems. But I've seen gremlins in them before. So, you know, uh, I hope you like the film pictures there. Um, trying to keep it on topic. So, um, so how do you uh, how do you really address technical debt? Well, you keep it simple and fit for purpose. You understand what you're trying to achieve, how far you're going with your efforts and requirements. The value of opening the door early by putting code out there, so code for code review and collaboration, uh, which is just in the spirit of open source. The level of analysis that's going to help you, so cost benefit analysis on what you're doing, um, but mainly so that it helps you uh, as a software developer or your team if you're working as part of a team. Um, and really understanding that refactoring is part of the process naturally. Uh, learning technologies will add to your toolbox. Learning patterns will help you structure complex scenarios. Learning methodologies such as project management, business analysis, agile software development, and software development life cycles are all great. Um, they'll help you organize your projects and your team. But once again, there is no universal solution. Every development is different uh, as much as every developer. So try things out, learn and refine your experience, but just accept that there's no shortcuts um, uh, as that Laurie discovered. Um, so the conclusions here of, uh, of, my, um, of my talk is um, everyone can be a critic in hindsight, but nobody can read the future. Eventually, any useful code will always be perceived as debt and get refactored. Um, addressing the impact and effort balance is part of the process. So work positively, see the value of refactoring and understand that refactoring is a method to interact with and give opportunity to other developers as well. Um, it's a really good way of getting people involved in your projects um, and um, yeah, it's ultimately, um, so uh, ultimately the intuition for refactor and uh, the intuition about how to identify technical debt and the refactoring are your key tools to maintaining your project. Many other tools will help with those tasks, but they are not one-stop solutions um, and there will never be one-stop solutions to all your problems. Having an effective rather than a broad toolbox is the most valuable thing um, and always adopting something new leads to proliferation of tools which itself can be seen as a form of debt. So stop, look and not listen but think. Uh, does the thing I'm offering deserve a couple of extra minutes now to save hours in the future? And that's fundamentally the, uh, the, the key here. So, um, so a bit of time now for any questions uh, that people might have. There's some exercises afterwards and I've got a few resources here, but please feel free to unmute or, or, or post a question in the chat. Um, if not, I will happily go through some of these resources. You know many of them, I'm sure, already. So things like the Turing Way, the Carpentries, the SSI and Stack Overflow and Wikipedia are all standard for the software developer. Um, GitHub is really important though. Um, so uh, people don't really think about looking at GitHub just to look at other projects and their source code, um, especially with projects with comparable functionality. So for me, a really important one was looking under the hood of Flask at Worksug, which gave me really good inspiration about how to deal with context management, which I now use in one of my tools called the Model Ensembler. Um, so you learn about your favorite projects as well as enabling your own projects by looking uh, into the source of others. Um, other examples here, so Project Eulo is a great one for learning new languages. You can uh, um, ultimately it rewards uh, it rewards forward thinking in your in your coding of the solutions to problems that you uh, address in there. GNU is a great one as well. Um, we use the tools every day like LS, CAT, all of these things. These tools have been around for 20, 30 years. 
So um, it, it's always worth going in and having a look at their source to see how uh, how you might take inspiration. Hyperpolyglot is uh, one of many examples of a Rosetta Stone type uh, site for, for various languages, which can be very interesting. Refactoring.guru, so once again, thanks to Steve for this. It's a brilliant site actually, which goes through design patterns as well as technical debt and refactoring. Um, and Cookie Cutter is great as well. It, it offers a set of templates that you can use in your projects um like uh, for various different languages um so so those are a set of resources that i think you can use um so next there's some exercises so um once again this will sort of be driven through the discussion section um so the first exercise is dead simple uh what is the one thing which will produce the debt reductions in the green line i'll give people a couple of minutes or a minute to answer that but hopefully I've uh, badgered, badgered people enough about this word. So, yeah. There's no praises for the exercises, I should point out, sorry. <laughs> well, I won't, I won't linger too long on this, but I think, uh, I think people have, yeah. Yeah, people are generally guessing. I think that's, yeah, refactoring is the, the number one word there. So we'll not linger too much on that. But um, over time, your debt is going to decrease if you spend that little bit of extra time just refactoring. And I think testing is, you know, is easily part of that as well. The more testing you're putting into your, uh, into your program, then the less time you have to spend refactoring because you know you can take some assuredness into the future. So that's great. So, um, so these are all toy examples. Um, so this is actually the code that created that graph, um, you know, very simple. Um, so uh, what debt do I have with this snippet if I were to try and reuse it? Um, hopefully everyone here is familiar enough with Python to know what the hell is going on on the screen. So. <laughs> Yeah, so fantastic answers coming out here. Brilliant. So, yeah, I, I mean, the first one there is perfect. No comment explaining what it's doing. So that's great. Um, magic numbers, hard-coded values, all the wrong things, absolutely. Um, so another one that I, I pointed out to myself uh, when I did this, uh, well, I mean, I did this intentionally, to be fair. But, uh, so uh, a couple of other ones we might want to consider here is there's no record of the imports I'm using. So I'm using Signal, but where does Signal come from? Nobody else who picks that up is going to get it. Uh, what else have we got? Unscripted variable names, absolutely. That's never good. Um, Hard-coded input values, that's also good. Another one that we can consider with Python, if you're familiar with it, is the inability to actually import the functionality anywhere else. So this, this Python file is completely useless uh, if you want to actually incorporate that um, anywhere else. So yeah, all great answers, thank you very much. So ex exercise three, this is actually looking at a Git repo for those of you who are not Python developers, this isn't Python. Uh, so you'll be a bit more familiar maybe. Um, so there's one really important way uh, that there's uh, some debt in this uh, this Git repo, um, and it's not code debt. This is something else. Um, so. So there we go. We've got a couple of we've got a couple of people who who got the same answer as me for that one, which is no read me. I mean that's just an absolute fail straight from the outset. Uh, there's some other really good answers there though. Mixture of code of data in the same bucket. Uh, that that's definitely true. Um, 
So this is actually a, 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 a very weird uh, sort of optimization language, but it's a toy example we've got. Uh, and it's just one commit, absolutely. But uh, I think the readme is the main thing there. If if you don't have a readme, then how is anyone going to know what D is, DZN or DMZN uh, are? Absolutely. Um, so we'll move on from that one. Um, so exercise four, if this were intended as a package structure for a public project, how does it introduce that? So this again uh, is a Python, uh, Python example. Um, there's a couple, I won't spend too long on this one, but there's a couple of, uh, We've got five minutes left, so we might be able to get on to the next one as well. So, um, yeah, brilliant. No dependency management, absolutely. So, yeah, I think people are thinking a bit more on this one. I mean, fundamentally, the reason why I think this is an absolute nightmare is because it's not a package like this is not structured as a python package so it wouldn't be very good so it's a very pythonic example of that one uh, no explanation how to install absolutely the readme is terrible that, that's another thing that can be easily highlighted um so uh, i should point out i don't necessarily release all of these <laughs> examples into the wild um, they're toy examples but uh so exercise five this is going into the bit more infrastructure as code type affair uh, why might you refactor this web app and I sort of gave the Frege, uh, and Frege alluded to this sort of example earlier. Um, there's probably many, many answers to this. So just to, we're conscious of time and there's one more example after this, I'll, I'll run through a couple. So fundamentally here, you've got all of your components installed on one server. We've got something called LAMP server, so everything's hard coded. And this is what people did point out quite helpfully earlier. So this is the fundamental problem with this uh, in these types of applications is that they're not built for scale. And if you know about your Unix sockets, basically they're local sockets that exist within one host. So ultimately, everything has to exist on that one host. You would never be able to make this row application scale. So that's a little bit of a more uh, esoteric example, maybe a little bit more abstract. Um, yeah, there you go. Somebody did put that in, that's grand. Um, yeah, sysadmin is doing backups, never rely on a sysadmin. He's got to have a holiday. She, he, she, they have got to have a holiday at some point. Um, right, and this is just, uh, this is intended in case I finish like 20 minutes early. There's probably a hundred different errors in there in here, but I identified 10. I wonder what code smells people can find in here. So when we talk about code smells, we're talking about things that are sort of just hinting, uh, hinting at something really, really wrong with this code or, you know, it, it, you know, something that deserved a refactor, but probably wasn't done uh, like during an incremental development phase or an iterative development phase. And we've got two minutes left for that. So I won't run through these too much. But, um, there you go, copy pasted code, whoever's writing that, you're absolutely on point. Um, yeah, direct use of argv, never a good thing. No, so especially when you think, you know, the standard library gives you things like argpass pass uh, that, are, that just make that a whole load more, uh, more clear, clear, sorry. Naming is inconsistent, yeah, no doc strings, perfect. Yeah. So brilliant. I think these are brilliant suggestions coming out. We've got long parameter lists here as well. Uh, the the long set of if clauses is a, is a, a classic. Uh, this is the Pythonic equivalent of a switch statement, which is identified as a, a code smell in of itself. It's, it's a really, really nasty uh, programming. Uh, you know, there are uses for it, but it's usually indicative of something needing to be broken apart. Um, Right. So yeah, what if I wanted to add six numbers? There you go, exactly. So start to abstract. So I think uh, we've got one minute left. So I just want to say thank you to everyone for listening. I really hope you found it all uh, all useful and we're, we're finished in good time. So.